Order. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 22 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot, and as a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Gallagher. Dear Mr President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. That being the Morrison government's incompetence in failing to appoint any civil society or union representatives to the Modern Slavery Expert Advisory Group, thereby establishing an unbalanced group that overwhelmingly represents business interests and undermining Australia's progress to eradicate modern slavery in supply chains. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debates. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr Deputy Acting uh, President. Just over 18 months ago, the Modern Slavery Bill 2018 passed the parliament, taking the first steps to tackle modern slavery risk in the operation of businesses and supply chains. This was the parliament working together to make progress to a fair, decent, compassionate and responsible country. These steps were taken because no country in the world is immune to modern slavery. The most recent estimates from the United Nations International Labour Organization predict there are 40.3 million people in the world currently trapped in slavery. That's one in every 200 people on the planet trapped in a form of modern slavery. Given the way in which people are forced into silence and subjected to abuse, there are more, undoubtedly, that we will never know about or be able to account for. Of those people, 24.9 million are in forced labor, working against their will and under threat, intimidation or coercion. That's the equivalent of the entirety of the Australian population being trapped in forced labor. The other 15.4 million people are estimated to be living in forced marriages, and yes, that includes people right here in Australia. Slaves are forced to clean houses or to be maids. They pick fruit, they mine minerals, they make electronics. There have even been reports of Nepalese migrant laborers facing exploitation and even dying in Qatar as the country builds infrastructure for the 2022 World Cup. Slaves even make the products and the clothes on the shelves of stores here in Australia. And close to 5 million people globally are trapped in forced sexual servitude or sexually exploited. This is a reality for millions of people around the world that we cannot ignore. And for those people who are trapped in forced labor and working in supply chains of products that end up in Australia, the Modern Slavery Bill and its reporting requirements are the beginnings of Australia doing its part to stop this scourge. From my portfolio perspective as the Shadow Minister for Home Affairs, we've seen tens of thousands of people end up in slave-like conditions on farms right here in Australia. On the Minister for Home Affairs watch, people are being trafficked to Australia on tourist visas, made to apply for asylum, then sent out to work in exploited conditions on farms or other jobs for the three or so years it takes to determine their asylum claim. Now, there's nothing wrong with claiming asylum. It's an important right. But 90 per cent of these applications are eventually found without merit. The number of airplane arrivals represents a work scam run by people smugglers as they expand their business model from boats to planes and it's trapping people in slavery. Even the Assistant Minister Jason Wood warned in a report to this parliament about this crisis unfolding on Mr Dutton's watch, and still Mr Dutton has not acted. Even today in the Sydney Morning Herald, there are stories of people smuggling venture being intercepted in Timor-Leste with 11 Vietnamese nationals seeking to get to Australia. In fact, the, the Task Force Emergency Response Coordinator in Timor-Leste told the Sydney Morning Herald that these Vietnamese have been offered work on Australian farms by people smugglers. You used to be able to trust this government with Australia's borders. Indeed, Operation Sovereign Borders has bipartisan support. But sadly, you can't trust Scott Morrison and Peter Dutton anymore. Labor wants Australia to be a world leader in tackling modern slavery. We don't agree with... We don't in fact, disagree with the government on this very important issue. But just as the government has stressed so many times in so many areas of policies, we must not set and forget 
The government announced on 17 February they would be establishing a modern slavery expert advisory group. The group has the purpose of, quote, collaborating with business and civil society to combat modern slavery and supply chains through Australia's Modern Slavery Act 2018. The government opened nominations for positions seeking, and I quote, experts with practical experience in business and human rights, procurement and supply chain management to help drive effective implementation of the Modern Slavery Act. Now these are sensible and important steps. And I thank the government, and I pay credit to Assistant Minister Wood for establishing the panel they announced three weeks ago on the 25th of May. However, there is a but, and it is a very significant one. There is not a single representative from civil society organizations or unions having been appointed to the panel. Not one from ad advocacy organizations, no charities, no modern slavery experts with practical experience, no one from the union movement. This leaves an unbalanced group that overwhelmingly represents business interests and undermines Australia's progress to eradicate modern slavery in supply chains. This isn't political point scoring. In fact, the statistics speak for themselves. From the 70 applicants, including many experts in the modern slavery field, not a single appointment has been made from those who are working directly with the workers who are at risk of modern slavery. I have significant concerns for what this group will be able to achieve without representatives from civil society or the trade union movement. The 10 appointments that have been made to the Modern Slavery Expert Advisory Group overwhelmingly represent business interests. Six out of the 10 appointments are from large Australian companies, including Bunnings, Telstra, Country Road Group, and David Jones. There are five permanent members in the group. Three of the five permanent members of the group are the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Australian Industry Group, and the Business Council of Australia. All of the groups directly represent the interests of business. A fourth, the Global Compact Network for Australia, is predominantly a network of Australian businesses. There's also one member of the group who has held positions in the Liberal Party in New South Wales. Yet still, no one from the union movement or civil society. On the 1st of June, a letter was sent to the Assistant Minister Wood from 20 civil society organizations, unions and academics, voicing their alarm following the government's announcement of appointments to this group. This letter here, signed by 20 civil society groups, warned that mass unemployment caused by the COVID-19 pandemic will heighten risks of labor exploitation, making it crucial for the government's approach to be informed by experts working directly with workers at risk. They stress that given the current panel of appointees, the government's efforts in combating modern slavery will be, and I quote, driven by companies that are subject to Australia's modern slavery laws, rather than by the interests of people at risk of modern slavery. I share these concerns, which is why I wrote to Minister Wood yesterday stressing the need for the government to listen to these experts. And I acknowledge that the minister has contacted me today offering a meeting. The government must ensure that the Modern Slavery Expert Advisory Group is balanced and has unbiased representation. The government cannot let their incompetence or their stubbornness potentially jeopardize Australia's response to modern slavery. The government worked with the unions and civil society when it came to addressing the COVID-19 pandemic, and the government is continuing to do so. The government can and they should take a similar approach now with modern slavery. How can the government comprehensively address modern slavery with an expert advisory group that contains no representation from groups who work directly with the workers who are working in slavery, who are at risk of modern slavery. It beggars belief. It defies logic. I implore the government and the Assistant Minister, Jason Wood, 
to make further appointments to this expert advisory group from civil society organizations, from churches, from charities, from the trade union movement to guarantee that the Modern Slavery Expert Advisory Group is balanced and informed in its representations. Importantly, so the voices and the experience of workers who are in modern slavery or at risk of modern slavery are heard and understood by the government. We must work together to get Australia's response to tackling slavery right. And the Labour Party in this parliament and in the community stands ready to do that with the government, which is why I have made these representations to Minister Wood. And I am pleased he has offered a meeting. I am hopeful that he's willing to enter into a dialogue that sees ballots come on board this expert advisory group. Because if we don't get our approach to modern slavery right in Australia, getting it wrong will do nothing to stop this scourge that is infecting tens of millions of people around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Uh, Senator MacDonald. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Deputy Acting President. Well, how disappointing to see such an important issue as modern slavery being picked up by the Labor Party and absolutely being made up of political point scoring. It once again demonstrates the lack of understanding that Labor has for how to get things done. And in this case, it's how to take a very practical uh, piece of legislation um, which has at its base an advisory group, an advisory group that will complement the existing consultative forums, such as the National Roundtable on Human Trafficking and Slavery, the National Roundtable, which was established 12 years ago in 2008. And that roundtable comprises of 12 civil society and NGO, NGO groups, only one business organisation, I have to point out, and one union. And there's yet this complete lack of understanding of how the advisory group will provide information back to business and back to government on the implementation of these important uh, initiatives and reforms. Uh, I am also very concerned that uh, Senator Keneally has talked about people in Australia working in modern slavery. And I'm sure that if she has knowledge of such circumstances, she would bring, be bringing that to the attention of authorities. I want to talk particularly about the great work that's been done in the agricultural sector. Most recently, it is GROCOM who has put together the Fair Farm Initiative. Now, Fair Farms is an industry-led initiative. It's aimed at fostering fair and responsible employment practices in Australian horticulture. And that's the kind of practical uh, and useful initiatives that ensure that workers are being paid properly and fairly. Um, and I want to expand on that to say how pleased I am that Coles has picked up that initiative and worked in partnership with GROCOM uh, to pick up the Fair Farms certification. It's a terrific initiative from very practical people ensuring practical outcomes. Um, and I imagine that the reason why Coles has done that is because of their ethical supply chain, their ethical sourcing policies, which they've gone to great lengths to put on their website, uh, and as has Woolworths and Aldi. It is unfortunate, though, that I can't I'm sorry, Senator Keneally saying something to you? I, I couldn't, couldn't hear. hear. Um, that it is, I'm sorry, I've just lost my train of thought, that it is uh, an important initiative to ensure that ethical supply sourcing uh, ensures that businesses are paid adequately to ensure that their workforces are paid properly and that there is a little bit of something left in it for the business. Uh, it is unfortunate that Coles and Woolworths and Aldi don't apply the same practice of ethical sourcing that they're now putting across through GROCOM and the Fair Farm certification to dairy and to dairy farmers who are being paid less than the cost of production, who are being uh, robbed blind of a fair price uh, by these big supermarkets, who are putting downward pressure on price uh, through the milk processes and the dairy processes 
and ensuring that dairy farmers um, are at the very bottom of an unfair negotiating uh, practices. And indeed, I was horrified to hear again this week that Lactalis, the Queensland-based uh, milk processor, is trying to introduce some new clause into milk contracts, saying that any dairy farmers who then do media on their contracts uh, would now be they would not have their milk picked up. Shame. What an outrageous Shame. threat to make to these hard-working Australians who have a very short shelf life for their milk. And, uh, and so it is important that we continue to work hard on ensuring that we don't have modern slavery in this country and that the advisory group uh, is a terrific initiative that will provide feedback to government about businesses' response to modern slavery. And, uh, and I thank you for that contribution. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Senator McKim. Uh, well, thank you very much. Acting Deputy President, I thank uh, Senator Keneally for bringing uh, this matter, a very important matter, before the Senate. And while I'm uh, handing gratuitous thanks around the chamber, I do want to thank and acknowledge the work that uh, then Senator, now Minister Reynolds, did um, in uh, shepherding the Modern Slavery Act um, through uh, the previous Parliament. Um, it was, uh, of course, supported. Um, by the Australian Greens, although we did express and we still retain um, the view that um, penalties should have been part of the legislation. Um, and, and I thank Senator Keneally for her, for her support for that comment. Uh, and I can only hope that when the review um, that is required does take place, um, there will be a recommendation for penalties to be inserted into the Act. Now, the Modern Slavery Expert Advisory Group is the topic of this uh, matter of public importance, and the, the Australian Greens share the concerns articulated by Senator Keneally because um, this uh, expert, uh, I'm sorry, this act, this piece of legislation, is essentially a supply chain management act, and it deals uh, in large part with working conditions. And it would have been most helpful if the uh, Modern Slavery Expert Advisory Group um, contained people with expertise in supply chain management uh, and with expertise uh, in and relationships with people who represent workers in this country. The Minister's guidance material on the Australian Modern Slavery Act states uh, in uh, the Commonwealth Modern Slavery Act 2018 guidance for reporting entities that, and I quote, collaboration with civil society organisations such as non-government organisations as well as other stakeholders like workers and their representatives can be an important way to strengthen your entity's response to modern slavery. Now, that's obviously um, aimed uh, at uh, corporations in the main, but the point that it makes is equally relevant to the makeup of the Modern Slavery Expert Advisory Group. So we do have to ask where are the civil society organisations and NGOs in this group, and where are the workers and those who represent workers in this expert advisory group? Now, I'm also in possession of the letter that Senator Keneally um, referred to. That is a letter to um, Assistant Minister Wood, signed by <coughs> excuse me, a number of civil society uh, and workers' organisations, including the Human Rights Law Centre, the Australian Council of Trade Unions, the United Workers' Union, the Uniting Church in Australia, Synod of Victoria and Tasmania, Be Slavery Free. Transparency International Australia, the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre, the Australasian Centre for Corporate Responsibility, Australian Lawyers for Human Rights, the Salvation Army, Action Aid, the RMIT Business and Human Rights Centre, the Victorian Trades Hall Council, the University of New South Wales, the University of Melbourne, the University of Technology Sydney, the University of Western Australia, Monash University, the RMIT, RMIT University 
and uh, the University of New South Wales, Canberra, at the Australian Defence Force Academy. Now, those groups and uh, the signatories to that letter which uh, represent those groups have made it perfectly clear to Assistant Minister Wood that uh, the appointments that have been announced by uh, Mr Wood to the Modern Slavery Expert Advisory Group overwhelmingly represent business interests. Now, this should not come as no surprise to anyone who's watched this government in action over the last parliament and this parliament, because, let's face it, they are most comfortable when they are hearing from their corporate mates. And they are least comfortable when hearing from uh, areas of our community like civil society and uh, unions who represent workers. I could also add, out of context to this debate, that what makes them most uncomfortable is receiving advice and suggestions from the environment movement. But that's a debate for another day. Now, as the letter points out, the need for the government's approach to be informed by those working directly with workers at risk is critical. And it's very difficult to argue with that sentiment. Very difficult indeed. And it's a sentiment that is shared by the Australian Greens. And we can encapsulate this debate by uh, the, the last but one paragraph in uh, that letter to Assistant Minister Wood, which says this. This leads to the disturbing result that Australia's efforts in combating modern slavery will be driven by companies that are subject to Australia's modern slavery laws, rather than the interests of people at risk of modern slavery." End quote. Um, let's be very clear about this. The Modern Slavery Act is not intended to be beneficial legislation for corporations. It's intended to be beneficial legislation for people at risk of modern slavery. That's what it was designed to do. And even though it lacks some teeth and it lacks um, some structures that would allow it to perform that role to the fullest extent of its capability, it is nevertheless still a decent first step down the road, and it could be made a better step and a larger first step down the road if the Modern Slavery Expert Advisory Group uh, appointments uh, were made with due consideration to the need to include uh, civil society representation and representation from workers and unions who represent working people in Australia. I also want to refer uh, to um, a couple of matters that have come up in uh, the debate around uh, racism in this country, a very welcome debate that, uh, that uh, our country and many other countries around the world are, are engaged in at the moment. And uh, it's a debate that people are putting their lives on the line to have in many parts of the world, including um, in, in Australia. We've had uh, a Prime Minister who uh, last week tried to claim that there was no history of slavery in Australia, and then when he was quite rightly pulled up on that, uh, tried to weasel uh, out of that claim with uh, a sorry if you're offended non-apology, the kind of non-apology that we hear far too much of uh, in public life in Australia at the moment. What I want to say is it's very um, uh, uh, difficult to understand how the Prime Minister of this country could be so ignorant of Australia's history. And there has been slavery in Australia. There has been and there have been many instances of slavery in Australia's history, shameful instances of slavery. And unfortunately, one of the big issues that we have in this country in the context of the debate around racism that we have had and are continuing to have in Australia is the fact that so many of our structures are based on a racist colonial legacy. The concept of terra nullius and the fact that we are yet 
to reach genuine reconciliation with First Nations people in Australia. And until we have a treaty with First Nations peoples in this country, we will still have significant unfinished business. And until we have that treaty, it's going to be very hard to eradicate the kind of systemic racism that far too many First Nations pe peoples and people of colour in this country face every day. And it's not just their daily lived experience. It is the structures of so much of what goes on in this country that are based on that racist colonial legacy and based on the fact that we have yet to come to terms with the dispossession, the murders, the genocide that occurred in this country in regards to white settlement and the way that uh, white people treated First Nations people when uh, white people arrived in this country. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, I'm pleased that the government is getting on with implementing the Modern Slavery Expert Advisory Group uh, and indeed implementing the legislation. But it will only be the world-leading initiative that we want it to be if it brings the right experts together, those with the practical knowledge and expertise in combating slavery. It's laudable and terrific that so many big Australian companies want to step up and nail their posts to the mast to combat modern slavery in Australia. But I tell you, they can't do it alone and they can't do it without the right people around the table. This group could be a, great, uh, a wonderful resource for taking steps towards crushing modern, modern slavery in our nation and indeed uh, making a contribution around the world. However, the appointments to this uh, group don't include anyone who have ever worked with people at risk of modern slavery. And I tell you that the places that modern slavery exists in our nation, you can see it in oh, look, I understand that there are experts in those companies who work in it in their global sub supply chains. I can tell you, I can see that there are some academics on it. But I want to tell you that we need a broader base than that. It needs to be people who can work with small business because we've seen modern slavery in our nation in uh, the agricultural sector. We've seen, we can see it in people's homes, uh, in domestic service. We can see it in so many locations around our nation. And as the Prime Minister proved this week in his ignorance and blindness to Australian history, it can be right under our noses and we can still not see it because of our cultural prejudices and our blindness. That means you know, when you see, uh, for example, a domestic servant in someone's house, you're going to assume that they're there of their own free will uh, and that they're being paid properly. You have to take your uh, blinkers off and look for exploitation in many places. So in our colonial history, you know, we saw incarcerated First Nations people as prisoners when in fact they were slaves. You might have seen uh, Pacific Islanders here as uh, uh, immigrants for employment like we do today when in fact they were very much slaves. So I want to put the onus on the government to say you need to have people on this advisory group who work directly with people who are in exploited labour situations today. People who are in these situations today in our nation, but also people who work uh, at the coalface with exploited labour and slavery-like conditions and slavery conditions right around the world. You see, uh, people who produce goods uh, and uh, exercise modern slavery, they're pretty good at hiding what they do from their supply chains. And I know that there are experts from corporations that are appointed to this panel that well know that, that, that well know that and will be quite good at what they do. I don't denounce that. 
but you must also have representatives from people who understand the kind of cultural leverage the kind of cultural leverage that people have over other people, economic and cultural, that puts them in these slavery conditions. I'm really pleased that Minister uh, Wood has acknowledged uh, uh, that he would like to meet with Senator Keneally uh, on the basis that so many groups have critiqued the appointments to this body. And I can see uh, my good senatorial colleagues opposite saying uh, that what Labor is saying is incorrect. Well, I have to tell you that I deeply respect the academics and the civil society groups that have written to Minister Wood raising their concerns. I don't negate the credentials of those that have been appointed, but I say to you it is blatantly one-sided and we've got an opportunity to fix that to bring in the diversity that will be required to, bring, uh, to combat modern slavery in our nation and globally. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Slavery is perhaps the most abhorrent practice in human history, and I doubt that that's a matter up for debate. If we all agree how deplorable slavery is, then I fail to see why those opposite would seek to make the elimination of modern slavery from international supply chains a partisan issue. But then again, history shows that nothing is above petty partisan politics when it comes to the Australian Labor Party, especially when doing the bidding of their union masters. Do you think abolishing slavery is a joke, Senator Keneally? I don't think so. Given the sharp decline in the relevance of trade unions, evidenced by the fact that they now only represent 14 per cent of Australian workers, you would think that this extremely sectional interest group would wake up and accept that its influence has diminished in line with its dwindling representation. Yet apparently not. Any opportunity to press their thumb on the scale to leverage undue influence for their flagging enterprise is grasped with gusto. And that's what today's matter of public importance from the Labor Party is all about. Senator Pratt, please take this seriously. Surely this is a new low, even for those opposite. At a time when the primary concern of this government is ensuring that as many Australians as possible are supported as we emerge from a global pandemic. The opposition can't resist making a petty political point, a point dripping with self-interest on an issue that should be above party politics and factional interests. Senator Keneally, please. The fact remains that Senator Keneally, I didn't interrupt you. The fact remains that ending modern slavery is an extremely noble and worthwhile goal and one that we should all be committed to. The Modern Slavery Act will hold large businesses to account for ensuring they work earnestly to mitigate the risk of modern slavery within their supply chains. The Act is the strongest legislation of its kind in the world. The Act sets clear mandatory criteria that businesses must meet. It creates a central register to house statements on modern slavery and even requires the government itself to report on modern slavery risks in procurement. The Australian government has a strong and effective national response to modern slavery and human trafficking. There are a powerful set of criminal offences with up to 25 years imprisonment available as a punish as well as specialist investigative teams working within the Australian Federal Police. The government works extremely hard to ensure that Australia's Modern Slavery Act is world-leading and drives a race to, to the top by business. Reporting requirements and the risk to brand reputation mean it is in the best interests of businesses to comprehensively deal with even the suggestion of slavish exploitation within their supply chains. Good supply chain management and ethically sourcing products are big winners in the modern marketplace. 
One need only look at McDonald's talking up their ethical sourcing of coffee to see that this is a path that big corporates are keen to take. Consumer, consumers support it, meaning it is a good business decision as much as a moral one. Let's not pretend anything about this legislation was rushed or that extensive consultation wasn't carried out. Consultation included releasing a detailed public discussion paper in August 2017, roundtables with representatives across the spectrum in September and October 2017, Thank you. more than 50 meetings with stakeholders and almost 100 written submissions. To put it bluntly, this was an extensive process that sought as much feedback and input as possible. The government has also released guidance on reducing the risk of modern slavery within the context of our COVID-19 response. The call to action around this initiative is one which has all parts of society united. Yet those opposite seek to categorise and divide on this very issue. Public nominations for the expert advisory group to assist with the implementation of the Act were sought in February this year. The group is a diverse one, made up of business and academic figures, as well as the previous former committee chair. Chris Couther, Crowther is an incredibly well qualified and experienced person to be on this committee. Chris led from the start on this issue and shared the parliamentary inquiry into the drafting of the legislation. Independent experts and people with pragmatic experience in this field, like those on the advisory group, are the people best placed to guide the application of the legislation to reliably identify and remedy problems within supply chains and to remain true to the spirit and objectives of the Act. It makes sense to combine the best theoretical and academic minds on a subject with the best practice from industry. This is what the exceptional appointees to the expert advisory group bring to the table. This is the best path forward to ensure that the trends and practices in this area are monitored and our responses stay ahead of attempts to disguise this wicked practice. Order. To, Sen to Senator, me, or, order, 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 Senator Reddick, ignore the interjection. Okay. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. To me, it is ludicrous to suggest that a union representative would somehow make any positive difference to this group, which is intended to be non-political and seeks to match the best industry leaders with leading academics with experience and understanding in the field. Unions have a chequered history when it comes to protecting work and workers often placing their own interests first. You need only look at Bill Shorten's time as AWU secretary. Senator Ask Ren the workers— Senator Rennick, order. I, just before my colleagues jump, I would urge you under the standing orders, if you're referring to those in the other chamber, by their title, the correct title, please. Sure. Ask the workers on the East Link project how they feel about union representation. So-called flexibility measures ripped workers off substantially. The builder then paid the union almost $300,000 over the next few years. Unions look after their mates in the ALP and vice versa. Then there was the Winslow incident, where workers had their union fees paid by the company, seemingly without their knowledge. Just a block of members being chucked into the AWU for no apparent reason. Or clean event where workers were signed up to the union without knowing, where the union numbers delivered diminished penalty rates of hard-working cleaners. Again, to enhance union influence in the Labor Party, cleaners and construction workers have been clear victims of modern trade unions. It is a disgrace, Acting Deputy President, a disgrace. Finally, if Labor are concerned about unions having more influence, why not bring them to the table on an issue where they do have a stake? They should perhaps look at getting unions on board with amendments to the Fair Work Act to make it easier for small businesses to comply. 
to just look at how difficult this is, we need only look at the failure of compliance by Senator Watt's old employer, Morris Blackburn. If an industrial law firm can't get it right, how can a small business owner with no legal training ever get it right? The fact remains that, except with those directly opposite, unions are less relevant than ever. In a global economy with complex supply chains, a union official is likely to be unqualified when determining how modern slavery might corrupt complex supply chains. This is the reason why none were selected, and, suggest, and to suggest that anyone is incompetent for making a correct decision only serves to sum up the ALP. A party who is interested in protecting their rivers of gold from union fees and superannuation funds. The hard-working Aussie battler was left behind by the Australian Labor Party a long time ago. Human rights are non-negotiable, and ending slavery is a critical goal. We should all be working together to achieve it. Right, uh, Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I was on the committee uh, of Hidden in Plain Sight. And, uh, along with many other Labor members, and, uh, and I do, as uh, uh, the Greens have already raised, uh, do commend uh, the Minister, Defence Minister uh, Linda Reynolds uh, for her work in bringing this through to the parliament. Uh, I also acknowledge that Chris Cruther MP, then chair of the time and was MP at the time, who uh, chaired it, we did travel over to the UK and we were briefed uh, quite extensively. Uh, in terms of uh, the UK uh, legislation. So we were able to, to listen and uh, have evidence uh, brought before us uh, in terms of uh, what worked, what didn't work. And it was quite clear, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, that the united uh, steps that this Senate and this committee, joint committee took to push forward this report, which is quite extensive. And we were enormously pleased uh, to, to push for an anti-slavery commissioner and clearly very disappointed uh, that it could not progress uh, beyond the current piece of legislation, but there's always hope. Uh, I note that New South Wales certainly took the step in terms of the first jurisdiction in Australia to appoint an anti-slavery commissioner. And I think there's certainly still scope, obviously, for the federal parliament to do the same in terms of this uh, piece of legislation. So that's why it's important that this uh, matter of public importance is brought on uh, in terms of the 10 people who are uh, and have been appointed by the assistant minister in this regard. And I, I bring to the attention of the Senate that there has been tremendous work on this from all sides of, of the parliament. Uh, this isn't just about standing up to raise an issue. This is actually about imploring uh, Minister Wood to actually listen to the concerns that are genuinely being raised here in the Senate through this MPI. Uh, one of the, we, we had over 250 submissions to this inquiry to Hidden in Plain Sight, and many of those came uh, from uh, certainly uh, not government organisations or companies. Uh, they came from smaller businesses and families. Uh, and certainly the, uh, the, the groups that aren't taken up in terms of business and corporate companies uh, that wanted to give their views, uh, certainly the religious quarters, all of those. So I think it's important to, to acknowledge that they're absent in this. And what about those NGOs? And I pick up on the previous senator's comments. <laughs> the unions are critical to this. Uh, they are very relevant because we're talking about workers and the exploitation of individuals, whether it's in family homes, on farming companies, and we've certainly heard plenty of that when we travelled around Australia. Over 4,000 people, we estimate, are to be still in slavery here in Australia. And so we needed to make sure that this expert advisory group reflected the concerns that were raised in our inquiry. So, so I would certainly urge Chris Cruther, who is on this, to, to push hard on Jason Wood, MP, Minister, uh, to push hard and make sure you do have union representatives 
you know, make sure you do have other expert advisory groups from civil society who can fairly bring forward a compassionate position but a very practical one in terms of the representation they bring on behalf of all those, especially the over 4,000 people that we are aware of in our estimates through this report, who are enslaved here in Australia today. So I'd urge senators to realise the importance of what this MPI is about. You think that these 10 people are being identified as not good enough? We're saying that you could do better. You must do better. So many senators and members have worked so hard on this particular piece of legislation. And we will not stop. We want to see an anti-slavery commissioner in this country. We want to stop slavery full stop. Over 40 million people around the world are enslaved somewhere. Over 4,000 of them are here in Australia. So this is a matter of public importance. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. If I could say at the outset that I don't have an issue at all with the representative of the trade union movement with appropriate expertise with respect to modern slavery, supply chain management, being a member of this expert committee. And I suspect there will be a fulsome discussion. As Senator Keneally acknowledged, the minister has agreed to meet with Senator Keneally, and that's a good thing. And I also acknowledge Senator McCarthy's warm comments directed towards Senator Linda Reynolds and also a previous member of the other place, uh, Chris Crowther. So those were very warm comments, and uh, I certainly acknowledge them. My issue with this MPI is with respect to the language. With respect to the language, can we come back for a moment and consider what civil society is? What is civil society? It's people brought together with common interests. With common interests, and every single person on that expert panel, whether or not they are uh, a member of a, a company, whether or not they're a legal academic, whether or not they've been at the forefront of setting up charities which have helped protect the most vulnerable people in our world, they're all part of civil society. And their common interest is to abolish modern slavery. And that's the concern I have with the wording of this MPI. It is a them and us MPI. Do, does anyone in this place seriously think any of the 10 members on that expert panel are going to be trying to wiggle their way out of complying with the legislation? Does anyone honestly think that? And I say that, I say that as someone who is a senior executive and a director of a company of companies in Laos, in PNG, in Myanmar, in Thailand. Companies where there was, in fact, modern slavery. I say that as a person who's held those senior director positions and senior executive positions. And you know what? You know what? We didn't even need a piece of legislation. We didn't need a piece of legislation to fight against modern slavery. We didn't need this chamber to pass this act when we decided to fight against modern slavery. Why? Why? Because it was the right thing to do. Because it was the right thing to do. It was the right thing to have appropriate due diligence with respect to supply chains, to make sure contractors and their subcontractors weren't engaging in abhorrent child labour. It was the right thing to actually visit those contractors, walk their factory floors, have a look at their occupational health and safety standards and see if they met the requirements. And each and every single person on this expert panel brings some expertise, particular expertise, to this co committee. And I think it's quite shameful. It's quite shameful that this MPI has been worded, and I don't know who worded the MPI, but I think it's quite shameful that it's been worded in this way that it seeks to pit business against worker. And we're talking about civil society here, civil society, collective interest, the collective interest to abolish modern slavery. And let's not forget the great Australian who was at the forefront of fighting against modern slavery, Twiggy Forrest. Twiggy Forrest. What side's Twiggy on? He was at the forefront of combating modern slavery. But the Labor Party, those, some of them, some of them, not all of them, but some of them, want to make it a partisan issue and want to say it's about them and us. 
them and us. And it's not. It's about collective interests, the collective interests to abolish modern slavery. And can I just refer to some of the qualifications of some of the members of that expert panel? Because one of them is a constituent of mine from my home state of Queensland, Dr Kate Van Doer. Kate has done an absolute wonderful job in setting up a charity, a charity that looks after orphanages. And, and I can't think of anything more vile than people trafficking in children, selling them into orphanages, selling them into orphanages. I can't think of anything more vile. And Kate has established a charity, an NGO, that specifically addresses that. Specifically addresses that. So why come into this place? Why come into this place and tip a bucket on these good people? Why? To what end? Why didn't you just raise the matter? Why didn't you just raise the matter in a civil way? in a civil way with the minister and say, you know what, it could be helpful, it could be helpful to avoid something like this if you actually put on a member from the trade union movement. It could be helpful. Why, why put forward this awfully worded MPI? It's just disgraceful. And to actually assert, to actually assert that this has the potential to undermine Australia's progress, to eradicate modern slavery in supply chains, how? 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 They didn't explain how. The fact of the matter is the legislation which was passed by this House through the committee Senator McCarthy participated on requires companies to put a statement on a publicly searchable register outlining how they comply with the, re with the uh, legislation in terms of their supply chains, how they do that due diligence, how they do that risk management on a searchable register on a searchable register. And the people on the committee are people who have experience in sustainability reporting, in public reporting by public companies, in terms of advocating on these issues, in terms of supply chain management. What an idea. Some of the experts we've got on the expert panel actually do supply chain management. And this is an issue? You couldn't raise it some other way? Goodness me. It's just despicable. Absolutely despicable. Let me refer to someone else. Let me refer to someone else who's had the, it, the bucket dumped on them by those opposite. In particular, Senator Keneally has dumped the bucket on them. Let's refer to another one, Sunil Rao, a lecturer at La Trobe University Law School. He actually founded the Modern Slave Initiative. He's written books on child trafficking, the history of anti-slavery laws. And what, you say he's unbalanced on the issue? Why don't you do your homework? Why don't you do your homework before you tip the bucket on Australians? It might be the way the New South Wales Labor Party behaved, Senator Keneally, but I would have expected you to rise to a higher standard when you came to this place. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. And let's let's not talk about the Victorian Labor Party. I'm not sure they're part of civic society, are they, Senator Keneally? Uh, Senator Scar, may I remind you to address your comments to the chair? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I think another point that needs to be noted in this debate is that this ex expert panel actually reports to the National Roundtable. And who's on the National Roundtable? So the expert panel reports to the National Roundtable. Now let's have a look who's on the National Roundtable, because I didn't hear anything about the National Roundtable from any of the speakers opposite. I didn't hear anything. No, I didn't hear anything about the National Roundtable from any of the speakers opposite. I certainly didn't hear an acknowledgement that the expert panel actually reports to the National Roundtable. So they report to a roundtable that includes the ACTU. So the expert panel actually reports to a round table that includes the ACTU. Includes the ACTU. They're actually subject to oversight by the body, by the body that includes the ACTU. And those opposite have an issue? Madam Deputy President, from time to time it, it is quite dismaying that those opposite make political issues out of those things they shouldn't make political issues on. This matter could have been handled quite differently, but they're chasing a headline. They're chasing a headline, Madam Deputy President. 
And I do hope, I do hope Senator Keneally's meeting with the minister is fruitful. But can I just say this? It would have been nice. It would have been nice if that meeting had occurred without tipping the bucket on good Australians. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Walsh. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy President. Well, earlier this year, I met with uh, Lydia and Dello, two women from uh, the Philippines originally, who are living here in Canberra, uh, and they had been recruited to work as qualified massage therapists. They'd been sponsored on 457 visas and signed contracts which promised them legal pay and conditions. But when they arrived in Australia, their employer took their passports from them, forced them to work 13 hours a day, six days a week, and kept them under constant surveillance. They were forced to live in an overcrowded house and they were locked inside. They were banned from talking to family and friends and were forced to hand back part of their salary in cash to their employer. All the time, their employer kept the threat of deportation hanging over them. Their family members back in the Philippines were threatened with violence and harm if they spoke out. And there were two groups who helped those women. One of them was the Salvation Army and the other was the union movement, specifically the United Workers' Union. So it is extraordinary that these groups have been excluded from this advisory panel. It is absolutely extraordinary. It was with the support of these groups that these women were able to bravely stand up and tell their story uh, and speak out and advocate on their own behalf for the justice that they so uh, incredibly deserve. Um, it is extraordinary uh, that they are not uh, participating on the government's modern slavery expert advisory group. Uh, because right now the likelihood is that if an example of modern slavery is found in Australia, it will be a union, it will be a human rights organisation, a faith organisation, a social service organisation that finds it. Uh, and it is also these organisations that are working directly with the workers who are impacted by modern slavery for them to be able to speak out and fight for justice. And it is these very organisations that have been advocating for the type of supply chain reform uh, that the senators on the other side have been talking about. These are the people who have been advocating uh, for this reform. So um, this is not optional. It is absolutely critical that this expert advisory group includes these organisations in the discussions around how we, as a country, as a society, can best tackle um, this tragic issue. Uh, and last year, I met with a group of farm workers who had similar experiences in my home state of Victoria, and their experiences were very much located in a supply chain um, of exploitation with supermarkets at the top. Uh, Mahali uh, was one of the workers who told me about contractors paying workers $10 an hour to pick fruit, lettuce and herbs, um, not far from where I live in Victoria. Uh, and Daniel told me about how the farm labour contractors are setting this up. They're charging thousands for visa applications. They're taking workers' passports off them on arrival. They're leaving the farm workers trapped in these exploitative conditions. They're unable to go home and they're terrified of speaking out for being reported to immigration. So it takes incredible courage for them to speak out. And of course, the organisations that are helping them speak out are the unions. And that is why we need the union movement to be included on this expert advisory group. I really welcome the government's decision to establish this group. Um, it is absolutely vital that this, or, this committee exists to inform uh, the government on responses to combating modern slavery uh, in supply chains. It's an incredibly important step uh, and we need to get Australia's response right. But again, it just cannot be the case that the very organisations that work directly with the victims of modern slavery are excluded from this advisory group. Out of the 10 appointments made to the advisory group, they overwhelmingly represent business and employers, uh, and that is just not good enough. Uh, and contrary to the comments made on the other side, of course we welcome business and employers being on that advisory group, but we want to see balance. We want to see the people who have been advocating for and speaking out uh, with these workers who've been exploited, who've experienced 
um, this modern slavery to be included in the discussion about the solutions. Uh, that is all we are asking for uh, in this matter of importance today. Uh, and the advisory group has received 70 applications to participate um, from organisations in the union movement and civil society, including the ones I mentioned before. So let's pay some respect to the organisations that have been doing the work to advocate and speak out with these Thank workers. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Your time has expired and the time for the MPI debate has concluded. Um